Okay. I think we'll get started. Um, honor your being on time this morning. Um, my name is Lisa Finaldi. I'm the community engagement leader at the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation. Tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today. Um, just to let you know, the program is being recorded. And also we're going to use the question and answer box and you can put your questions in throughout the program and we will be monitoring that. And if we don't take them up during the program, we will absolutely take them up um, at the end. We expect to be done in about 40 or 45 minutes. So we hope to give you back a little bit of your time today. Um, I wanted to give you a minute about um, the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation, which um, is the parent for the Family Forward North Carolina Initiative. So our, we have been, um, we're a very young organization, been in business for about eight years, and our focus is on children from birth to age eight. And our work is really um, helping to align the various systems that are currently not one, as is probably the case in your state as well, where we have childcare, pre-K and, um, and grade school, and really trying to look at how those can be aligned to be most effective for children to be reading um, on grade level by the end of third grade. And we know how important those early years are to them. So our work is focused in three areas. We are building public will to ensure that there is um, excellent system as well as the, the funding to ensure that system can be effective. We also uh, run a lot of collaboratives where we really work to bring people together to look at how we can align the system. And thirdly, we do analyze public policy as well. So in addition to myself today, we'll hear from Emily. She is the president of EBS Strategies. Um, we have worked on this project together since the beginning and it is Emily's brainchild. So I just wanna give her the shout out for that. And um, we continue to um, work together towards our goals for family-friendly workplaces. Um, quick overview of our agenda. We'll give you a very brief um, overview of the initiative. Many of you already are aware of that, but some may not be. Um, we're gonna tell you about how we're framing our story. And then most of the rest of the time will really be about um, licensing um, of Family Forward North Carolina. I also just wanted to say how thrilled I am for you to be here and also the number of states that are represented um, or have signed up for the program. Um, it makes us feel like, um, feel good about, about what we want to do with you today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Emily. Good morning. I will um, echo what Lisa just said that we are thrilled to have you here. Welcome. Um, I am going to give a very quick overview. I know, um, I think all of you we have spoken with before. And so, you know, this will just be a very quick recap and then we'll turn it back over to Lisa. But as you know, um, with Family Forward NC, we work directly with employers, all industries, all sizes to really create employer-led change and to encourage increased access to family-friendly uh, policies and practices, and increasingly to really build um, advocates and champions within the business community uh, around supports for childcare, paid leave, and other workplace supports. And so, you know, as we started our initiative, I'll just walk you through the various phases. The first phase of our work was really listening and learning. We, um, there was data at the time um, about access nationally, but there really wasn't a ton of data about policies and practices on a state by state basis. And so um, as we, you know, we, with the understanding that North Carolina employers would really want to understand and know what was happening within North Carolina, um, we conducted that research of, of employers and employees to identify um, the, the benefits that have uh, positive outcomes, both for business and for child health and well-being and family health and well-being. And then also to really get um, opinion and perception um, data from employers and employer employees. And then we also had an advisory council who worked with us throughout the beginning stages of the work um, as we were putting together what eventually became our guide to, to family-friendly workplaces. And we made sure with our advisory council that we were including leaders from the business community along with early childhood experts, folks from our Department of Health and Human Services um, and early childhood experts as well. 
once we gathered all of our state data along with a national um, data, um, some national data research, we pulled it all together into our guide to family forward workplaces, which you've likely seen on our website. Um, that is informed by our advisory council. It's informed by our employer and employee research and, and has evolved as we've continued to engage um, employers over time. Uh, when we launched the guide, we also hosted a, a family forward summit um, that had 140 way back when, when we were all getting together in person and hopefully again at some point um, with business and community leaders to, to really dig into the guide, but then also um, begin the process of peer learning uh, so that employers could learn from other employers what um, they could do within their own workplaces. And we've been uh, in our engage and inspire phase ever since. We've talked with or engaged with more than 6,000 employers all across the state, um, both virtually and in person. We've really dug in with them on, um, on challenges, on opportunities, on you know, helping them learn from their peers. We've published 30 case studies to date, and then we've got a number in the, in the hopper. Uh, one of the things that we learned early on is that that peer learning and inspiration from other employers was particularly uh, important and, and, and even more so in industries like hospitality manufacturing where we've had quite a bit of focus, um, which are industries where traditionally family forward practices and, policy, practices and policies aren't um, a norm. And so, you know, really um, that, that inspiration and those ideas uh, coming from peers, coming from other employers has been an important part of the work. Uh, when COVID hit um, in March of last year, um, Lisa and I knew that we wanted to help support employers through COVID. And again, we had done a lot of work and had been doing a lot of work in hospitality and manufacturing, which, you know, like all industries, all industries were hit by COVID, hospitality and manufacturing were really impacted by COVID. And so we created a rapid response program that helps employers and uh, address employee needs and challenges throughout through COVID. Um, done a lot of work again with restaurants, um, not only providing written resources, but one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, and small group counseling from some HR experts who we um, contracted with to do just that. Um, and we wanted to include one of our quotes. This is from uh, Charlie, worked at the at Mitchell uh, Gold and Bob Williams, which is in rural North Carolina, it's a, f a furniture manufacturer. Um, and so, you know, gathering these stories and these quotes from working parents and from employers has really helped to advance the work. Um, and Lisa will talk a little bit more about how we incorporate those case studies into the, the copyright package. We wanted to, to, to share our official theory of change. Um, again, several of you have seen this, but you know, our, our belief um, and, and what we've seen is that um, by educating and engaging employers, really inspiring them, providing with resources, support, knowledge, um, we are able to propel action toward creating more family-friendly workplaces across North Carolina, and then as a result, healthier and happy happier children and families, uh, more productive workforce, and a stronger economy, um, which, you know, in many respects, uh, as we are work our way through, through COVID, many of the, um, much of the need for Family Forward last year has been, um, is, is even more so has been exasperated now um, as we continue through COVID and kind of figure out this new, our new economic challenges. So I think, you know, this, this, the concept of really um, involving and, and, and um, incorporating child health and well-being and some of the brain science that, that goes into um, early childhood and, and um, you know, the work that NCCF does writ large is really core to our strategy and is in many um, instances the first time that many of these employers have um, seen this data and, and are able to kind of layer it into what they know is happening within their workplace um, with regard to, you know, attraction and retention of employees, this adds that, that next layer about, of understanding about what's happening with children from birth to eight and how really being family friendly now not only supports 
workforce today and some of your immediate challenges, but is going to support workforce of tomorrow and our economy, you know, for the next few decades. That has been, um, it, it's been fun to watch and interesting to watch when Lisa and I present to employers and we bring up the brain science and, and, and this piece of the work. It's been fun to watch light bulbs turn on and to see how that starts to kind of reframe the conversation. We often talk with employers about the third grade reading um, scores and, and, and why um, those are so indicative of future success um, and, and health and well-being down the line. And so we will often share the statistics about um, reading proficiency, how that levels up to uh, ACT college and college readiness, um, and then you know eventually what that means from a, a career readiness um, perspective. And then we are very clear um, every time we talk with employers about ensuring where we can disaggregate the data and really show that the um, the picture is different um, and the need is is higher for students of color. Um, and and it, when we're talking about current workforce, we also have data, disaggregated data that shows that, um, you know, by by and large, um, people of color, women of color, are disproportionately impacted by having less access to uh, things like paid leave, childcare supports, you know, that kind of thing. And in particular, as we move through COVID, that data has, you know, continues to be teased out more and more. So making sure that we are also showcasing that that story uh, through the data is important to us. And then we really talk about what, um, how we can unleash potential and how employers and, and the business community um, can play such a key um, role in ensuring that success. So the, the kind of three-pronged message uh, focuses on um, business outcomes, on child, family, and, and health and well-being outcomes, and then on that kind of workforce of tomorrow piece. So, you know, we start with business smart, we build the business case um, that, that these needs are not going away, um, that, you know, paid leave um, ensures that, that families can care for themselves and their loved ones, that flexibility is key, that all of these practices really ensure um, both good business outcomes and good child health and well-being outcomes and family health and well-being outcomes. In particular, now we talk a lot about child care um, and with the current workforce shortage and, um, you know, some of the things that employers are struggling with currently, a lot of that centers around um, need, child care need um, and lack of access to, to child care. So, you know, we talk a lot about how um, before the pandemic, here in North Carolina, and I'm sure, and I know that this is the same in many of your states, um, you know, 99 out of 100 counties were child care deserts before the pandemic. That need has been exasperated um, because of the pandemic. We talk a lot about how women in particular um, have dropped out of the, the labor force. I even hesitate to say dropped out, have been forced out of the labor force um, in large part because of caregiving burdens and that, you know, nearly 2 million of them have, have yet to return. Um, so, you know, again, really showcasing how this need is not going away and that it does impact businesses um, while also impacting child and family health and well-being. And then, again, many of you have, you know, you, you know Professor Heckman's work, um, you know the equation, but this is new to, to the business community uh, typically. And so talking about this 13% ROI when you invest in, in early childhood um, is, is really strong um, in terms of building the, not only the business case, but the, the case for supporting early childhood in, in general. I'm gonna kick it back to Lisa to talk specifically about our licenses. Thank you, Emily. I also just wanted to say thank you to those of you who had done the economic analysis of childcare before us. We were very inspired and used um, a lot of your work um, to move forward on that project last year. So here's just a little bit about what is inside the package. So we have a two page fact sheet that is an overview of Family Forward North Carolina um, in addition to um, the theory of change that Emily shared with you, you know, we do have a document that really goes through the strategy and how it's propelling action for change. Um, Emily also mentioned, you know, the number of people that we've spoken to and surveyed and interviewed across time. And at the outset, 
we did hire a pollster to create um, questions to both interview 300 employers and also survey 300 employees. And so that's part of it. We have uh, reviewed and did some updates to the survey questions, but this is information that was provided from a professional pollster that we worked with. What was really nice about that is that it really did show um, what was going on today at that time for um, employers where they might want to go with it and what employees um, interest was in, um, in family friendly workplaces. You've seen the guide. Many of you are using it already for sure. And also, again, we've added this how to. Um, a lot of this is sort of the playbook and some of it is public material for sure. And then finally, um, the case studies being so important to the work, not only have we provided a template, but also again, a sort of how to. Um, Emily writes most of these case studies, so that's what she's been up to. So on the case studies, uh, just very key to the strategy. This is what the document looks like here on the right. Um, Emily already mentioned this, um, so I don't need to go back over it. It's really just showing what's possible. We specifically looked uh, to the types of businesses that might be considered unexpected and also in areas that were strategically important to us, both from a manufacturing um, and hospitality or business perspective um, in the companies that we wanted to focus on, but also it had to do with the, the geopolitics of North Carolina. And I'll show you a little bit about that. Um, and again, here's the sort of the how to, the elements to create a credible study, um, publishing it, sample questions, in addition to interviewing a um, the HR director or CEO, depending on you know the size of the business, we're also interviewing and talking with employees as a way to verify. We're also asking them to see their um, their policies. Um, so we work hard to make sure that these are accurate studies. So here's an example of sort of geopolitics in North Carolina. We have one of the largest military bases in the world, which I didn't realize it was the world until I did some research yesterday. But Fort Bragg. Um, which is south of Raleigh. And we were thinking about, so how does somebody run a business when your partner, your spouse might be being moved around the country or the world, uh, frankly, um, because of their, uh, their duty? And so we found this company called R Riveter that creates leather handbags and wallets and you know, leather, uh, leather goods. And they're able to provide all kinds of paid leave programs, which are so important to people in the military or military families. And also they have a telecommuting policy. So if you're moved to Idaho, you can take your sewing machine and you can still make leather handbags in Idaho. So we thought this was a, a great example. Um, it appeals to a lot of people in North Carolina because we have many military bases and there's a lot of pride in those, in those bases. Also rural is very important to North Carolina. We have 80 out of 100 counties are rural in our state. And so we thought it was really important to make sure that we have case studies about rural places. Um, and so Emily um, alluded to this one before, but this is a furniture manufacturer that has had an on-site childcare center for, I think it's about 20 years now. There's also an on-site health center. And you saw from that quote from Charlie earlier on, the importance of the center. So even though the employees are paying for it, the reduction in stress, their ability to go see their child uh, during lunchtime, not having to do all this drop off pickup concerns um, is so important. And obviously it's a, it's a high quality facility. So um, we interviewed uh, Mitchell as well as some employees to really tell the importance of this story. He also said from a financial perspective um, that the facility was a break even for them. And so these other um, parts of their um, business culture mattered so much that it was worth their while. So here's the investment in, in the packages. Um, and I will just remind you, um, if I didn't say it earlier, that the materials here that are um, to be used externally are all adaptable and customizable. And within the license, we talk about um, how our trademark needs to be used, but there's, um, <clears throat> it's a $3,000 um, investment into all the materials. Then um, we would like to do some trainings with you. We feel that really is a great companion to the materials package. I know many of you are in very different phases of your work, 
Some of you may very well be working beyond what we're doing, getting started, thinking about getting started. Um, and so we thought the training could also be really helpful to, to many of you. So the half day training, which right now is interactive, open to discussing um, a different approach. And so two trainers uh, really focusing on build, launch and implement a lot of what we've talked about today in the program is $8,500 investment. And then you may also decide that consultation may be how you start or depending on where you are in your work that that could be beneficial to you. So we also can um, can offer some consultation. Before we get into questions, I just wanted to share a few more testimonials that really are about um, work into action. And so Greensboro, North Carolina, which is very much a working city um, in our state. <clears throat> the Chamber of Commerce, we've worked with them for about two and a half years now, and they have made a decision to uh, provide their employees with um, a parental, a paid parental leave program. And in addition, you could see Cecilia just talking about the partnership and the culture shift that's going on within her community um, due to some of the work we've been doing. And then also our state health director, recognizing that we do not have public policy around these issues at this time in North Carolina. And there's a lot of discussion about what could happen uh, federally uh, for sure. But as we move forward, um, these are innovative strategies as what she said, you know, roadmap sort of pathway um, to moving towards public policy. So I'm gonna show you a fun um, video real quick. Uh, Katie Button is a CEO of um, a group of restaurants in Asheville. She has truly been one of our, um, our champions. She talks about the how, the why, and the results of being a family-friendly workplace. And again, an unexpected place to be so family-friendly. So I'm just gonna make sure that I can make this happen on YouTube. We've always felt that family friendly practices in our workplace have been really important. Over the years, we were making it a priority to add a new benefit each year, really building those out. Um, before the pandemic hit, uh, you know, we were offering things like kind of unique uh, ideas around health insurance, paid time off. Um, we had just built out lactation rooms in each of our facilities. Um, we were really, really like thinking, thinking about and making strides in, um, you know, kind of advanced scheduling. And we've always, you know, flexible scheduling has always been really important to us. When the pandemic hit, there were a few things that immediately came apparent to us that we needed to beef up. Um, one of them was our sick day offering. We had always kind of offered sick days to our salaried manager level um, employees, but we knew that it was something that was important for everybody. So we started adding um, the sick day benefit to all of our workers starting on their first day of employment with us. And then um, we kind of beefed up our paid time off policy as well and have been really um, strict about our offerings related to time off um, with COVID needs. So basically, if a doctor determines that an employee based on symptoms or, uh, or potential exposure needs to be tested or stay home and quarantine, you know, we added extra protection for our workers to ensure that those types of scenarios that would always be paid, um, no matter how often that happened. And we've really stuck by that. And I think that that's really important in this time because it, it's, it's contributing to the feeling of um, safety and health of our workers in our workplace. Over this past year, there are some practices that we've really had to change and think about and it switched our kind of mentality on. The very first thing is the importance of communication and transparency with our teams. You know, we implemented from the beginning, you, it, you know, when we had to shut down our dining rooms in March and laid off all of our workers, the very first thing we did was unemployment support. It was helping them enroll and get access to the unemployment benefits 
that they had available to them and really helping hold their hand through that process. And um, that was extremely important. And then from there was continuing communication. So email communication, then we set up um, these regular Zoom meetings with our teams where we meet as a group and um, uh, over Zoom every other month and we kind of dive into issues that are their concerns. We get to hear any things that um, they're worried about and um, and then uh, be able to respond to those and have open dialogue. And that has been really important uh, for us during this time. The other one is just our continued, um, you know, kind of, uh, we're very firm in our beliefs that we want all of our workers to be earning a, a living wage. And we've watched living wage rates increase. And just recently, you know, 1580, when health insurance is being offered um, at a workplace is now the new living wage rate in our community. And we've committed to ensuring that every worker who works for us is making at least that much. And we do pay audits to ensure that that's the case. And, um, and we feel really good about standing by that um, living wage requirement. From the employee perspective, you know, these benefits that we're offering um, are giving them a sense of uh, I don't know, trust and integrity that our business holds, you know, they just, they, I think they feel better. Um, in particular, in this time, our insurance of paying for any time off that they need related to COVID testing or quarantining um, required by their doctor, like that is a big one. Uh, you know, the, the other big thing that we do that we started doing this year that I didn't mention earlier is, you know, our health insurance benefits, we offer kind of a base plan but then on top of that, we couple it with a direct primary care membership. And we make that membership available from day one of their employment um, for the direct primary care. And what we're seeing during this time of working with direct primary care physicians is that our workers have faster, more consistent, and better access to health care. I mean, in a time that's super crucial for them to have that, you know, it's it's been one of the major changes that we've made that I think is impacting, having the most positive impact. So what I think it'll do is reduce turnover over time in our industry. I think people see that we are, we have these family friendly um, benefits and that's our focus and and we're seeing that happen we're seeing workers have children and and continue working and and for those you know who during a pandemic aren't able to because it is true it's a fact child care is extremely challenging right now you know we're having conversations with them so that we can continue to help them with any sort of unemployment um, information that they might need ensure assuring them that they need to be reaching out to us when they are at a place that they are able to work again or child care issues have no longer been a concern and that we will work with them on scheduling and whether they need daytime or nighttime or um, or whatever flexibility that we can possibly offer based on the position that they're um, that they're in, and and that feels really, really good. It's uh, it's it, the ripple effects are enormous. It is true that like the first barrier as you know a small business owner that um, comes to mind is the financial cost of offering more benefits to your workers. I mean, margins are tight, particularly in the hospitality industry, and it can feel like too much to take on. Um, I think that what we did was we incrementally, we've been open, we're hitting our 10 year anniversary this year. And what we did is over, we did not get to where we are today in one year, you know, over 10 years, we have added one at a time or, you know, some years two things where we just dipped our toe in. We were like, we're gonna do this and see what the impact is. And what we have seen every single time we have done that is that the cost of turnover is really high. Just, and it's not only um, a cost, financial cost, it's a stress cost on your teams, on your managers, on their coworkers. The idea of having to like last minute fill in shifts because somebody, another person left and like, and needing to bring on a new person and get them onboarded. It takes months 
probably six months to a year for somebody really to get invested in a restaurant's culture and understand the place that they're working. So, um, you know, we've just seen that the cost of um, adding these benefits, you know, one at a time over a course of 10 years has saved us money overall and stress and like worry in watching our turnover drop. If you could have any superpower, what would I you pick? I was gonna not have that happen. Super speed. Sorry. I tried very hard to not let that happen, but it did anyway. <laughs> um, anyway, I hope that was um, helpful to you. Uh, just before we get into questions, uh, I wanted to let you know that you know our Smart Start in North Carolina is often the child care resource and referral service. And so we partner with them every day um, to ensure that businesses know that there is that sort of one-stop shopping place to find out about affordable uh, care that is also high quality. And also I think I missed um, one point that I really wanted to bring forward. And that is, you know, why do we think this licensing um, can be good for, you know, people in other states? We recognize that uh, we should all be, you know, working together across states because we're working for the same purpose. And also, you know, we've done this research and also with the information from the surveys and getting out and talking to people in the field so much, we have a really good understanding about what, um, what businesses want, what their challenges are, um, and also what employees needs are. Um, we felt really good about that um, at the outset. So we weren't starting at a place where we had to convince businesses, it was more about how do I get there, as Katie mentioned. Um, also, our materials are really geared towards business people. It's how they want to see information. They want to see concrete um, information that is credible, that has results. And you could also see that our brand is very uh, business friendly. And then finally, I think Emily really mentioned it before, but that, that frame about children first um, has really been um, unique, at least in North Carolina, for how we tell the story. So I'm going to stop there, and Samara is going to manage the questions for us. So I'm going to turn it over to Samara. Thank you, Lisa. There is a question here asking if there were any surprises in the results of the interviews or surveys, and how did that impact your strategy? Sure, that's great. Um, <clears throat> I just spoke to that a little bit, but. Um, what we discovered with, with employees, which you know, we had no idea what we would expect at the outset, but we certainly thought employees would be asking for a lot more. But in fact, flexibility was by far the largest choice of what employees were looking for. And that very much speaks to parenting, um, to have the ability to be flexible. So that was, that was a little bit of a surprise. It was almost, it was just overwhelming that that was um, a focus. And also, I think that um, employers tend to get very nervous about employees, you know, asking for the world on day one. And so um, it just gave us some understanding, not that we told them that, <laughs> but it gave us some understanding about um, where you might be able to begin. And then I'll say from the employer perspective, um, I think I, um, I talked earlier a little bit about how um, we were surprised at how open and interested and how many benefits were already being offered and that there was aspiration to do more for many of the employers that were interviewed. So that really, that really showed us where we should start rather than making assumptions about, oh, in rural communities in North Carolina, nobody cares about this or, you know, the things you might just think based on what you know about your states and your communities. So I'll stop there. I think Samir is saying that there's no other questions. All righty. So uh, just to let you know that the program's being recorded, uh, we will send it to you. <clears throat> Emily did mention to me that there was a little trouble with Katie's video. So we will send you the link to that separately. I know there was a little hesitation between the audio and, um, and the video there for sure. And we'll, we'll follow up with you, find out more about your interests and, um, and talk with um, all of you at, at your leisure if you'd like to do that further. But we uh, absolutely welcome your thoughts, your ideas and um, the ability to, to work with you. So you know how to reach me. 
um, you could also sign up for our, uh, our newsletter. And you'll also see that um, Emily's social media tips and resources are awesome. We put out just so much data about what's happening in the world of um, business these days and the needs of employers. And also we see that we're in some ways back to where we were in January of 2020, where at least in North Carolina, the unemployment rate was incredibly low. Um, and what that means is, is that we had um, a huge uh, competition for talent. And so for a variety of other reasons right now, while unemployment isn't low, we do have um, a tremendous competition for, for workers, not just workers, but workers who are competent. And, um, and so that's, that's sort of the same of it. Um, and then we always just like to thank our sponsors, the North Carolina Institute of Medicine um, and the CDC. And also through the, um, the COVID work, we were able to work with economic development folks. Um, economic development partnership is focused on manufacturing and tourism. So that was really in our wheelhouse and they gave us access to a lot of organizations that um, it might take an extra step for, our, for us to access independently. So um, that's it for today. I see that we got finished in 36 minutes. So um, last call. Oh, okay. All righty. So we stop recording and um, look forward to hearing from you and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you all.